Okay, uh, many thanks, Barney. Um, some of you may wonder why I have a GIS-focused presentation before BIM. Um, the answer for me is that a lot of people actually think that BIM is just a GIS. So there's a sort of a, a transition sort of thing to think about there. Um, just a little bit of sort of context to um, my talk. Um, I work for Historic England and I currently work within the remote sensing team of Historic England, <laughs> which incorporates, well I still say aerial surveyors, but I, uh, I've been in Historic England and Heritage quite a long time, so uh, that's why I still talk about aerial surveying. You've got the geophysics team, principally based in Portsmouth, uh, with the landscape strategy um, post as well. I actually sort of manage a very small team of two and a half people and you can see from the slide there that uh, we are sort of similar to what James was talking about in terms of the various technologies that we use, laser scanning, photogrammetry, etc, etc. Now the technologies that we use are summarised in this rather sort of uh, faded diagram. Uh, which I've been using for quite a long time, but it actually puts into context where the different technologies typically fit. And if you actually look, if you can, we, we can see the scales now. <laughs> the scale down the left is the actual complexity of data. I've been a surveyor for 34 years now, and when I first started surveying, I was probably dealing with the blue techniques. And on a good day, I might hit 100 points a day. Um, these days we're talking about mass data capture. The likes of laser scanning generate sort of billions of points, whether you want it to or not. So you can see where the different technologies are generating lots and lots of data. Along the scale at the bottom actually summarises what archaeology and heritage and all the different scales of object that we deal with. Objects, buildings, sites, landscapes, national landscapes and you can see where all of the different techniques typically have their place. I'm going to throw the drone word in. I saw a picture of a drone in an earlier slide um, so I thought well I'll, I'll mention it uh, myself. Drone based remote sensing is here whether or not you like it or not and that is enabling us to actually capture lots and lots of data over a much wider application area. You might just be able to see some of the technologies that are now being sort of uh, bolted to the bottom of a drone. You've got a LiDAR unit there that's capturing hundreds of points for every sort of square metre. Multispectral cameras and hyperspectral cameras, they're all coming along and they'll be actually bolted to the bottom of a drone. Another technology which is mentioned in the notes is structure for motion. Uh, some of you may think this is a new technology, it's not. It's photogrammetry under a sort of a, a modern cloak, uh, but it's using multi-image photogrammetry. And you can see once again, the application area is even wider. Now, you might see some survey techniques we might use in the future. This is not a plea to the senior management that are in the room for sort of more funding to buy bits of kit. However, there are technologies out there like mobile mapping which are starting to come into our application area. There you see a vehicle, a very nice Volvo vehicle, <coughs> with a mobile mapping unit bolted to the top of that. So it means you can actually travel along a highway, a sort of road, infrastructure, gathering lots and lots of data. The interesting area for me is that this technology is now coming indoors, which is where we've got the link with BIM. There you've got technologies that are actually recording data as you walk around. So effectively you could do um, two jobs at once and that you can actually um, analyse the, sort of, uh, the building environment whilst you're capturing data about it. You won't be able to see the detail of that scan but the people in the York office will actually uh, be interested. That is half of Tanner Row that was captured within 15 minutes by a colleague walking around with one of these mobile mapping units. So that brings me into BIM, and I could ask the question of everyone here, what is BIM? You will all have your own definition of it. There is no consistency, really, in what BIM actually is. There's a description on the slide there, but the two words I would emphasize is collaboration 
Barney's always also mentioned it already, collaboration, sharing of data. If you don't have the sharing, I don't think BIM will work at all. And also, life cycle of the building. This is about data not just for now to be put on a shelf, it's for data to be captured that can be used throughout the duration of a project and ideally a structure or a monument. It's not software, it's not Autodesk Revit, it's not Bentley BIM, it's a process. And it's a process that enables us to digitally um, illustrate a building and the components that, uh, that um, it's constructed of. And this sounds brilliant for heritage, um, but there are people out there that are saying it's not a matter of if, but when your firm organisation will actually implement BIM and get on the BIM bandwagon. Is it relative to heritage? Perhaps. Existing it, BIM, um, the BIM that we're using today comes from the design world. So it's actually using processes that are maybe not purposefully designed for heritage in archaeology. Bearing in mind what we just heard in the previous speaker, uh, the idea of a sort of an archaeology focused BIM might be an idea for the future. The thing with heritage is that most of it is irregular. Uh, admittedly, we're in a fairly sort of um, regular room and structure here, but one of the problems is squeezing irregular heritage into what is a regular BIM box. And even though the title said Historic Building Information Modelling, that's actually quite a narrow focus, but if you think about the actual uh, percentage of listed buildings, for instance, of the UK sort of building stock, it's only 2%. So even if BIM or HBIM was used across the board there, it's still got a very sort of narrow area of application. I actually heard of a, another acronym just yesterday at another workshop up in Manchester where they were talking about eBIM which is actually existing building information modelling. And if you actually bring BIM within a sort of much wider context, it starts to become quite apparent and applicable across the board. Within the UK, the, the, the UK government is pushing BIM in a big way. Uh, there is a deadline of 2016, October 2016, for what's known as Level 2 BIM implementation. But as well as the sort of the, the BIM task groups, different application areas like conservation are starting to engage with it, consider the implications for using it and how they can make use of it. And for instance, you've got the BIM 4C group that I'm actually representing EH and Historic England on, and you've got various uh, representatives from the other uh, heritage organisations. This is trying to raise awareness of BIM and promote the benefits of BIM, because at the end of the day, someone has to pay to have BIM generated, and you've got to actually encourage people to see uh, the sense, see the you know, potential use of it, so that they can actually include it within the funding. So what are Historic England and English Heritage doing about BIM? Well, back in January 2013, uh, English Heritage generated a special interest group. BIMSIG, it's called, and there you can see collaboration, admittedly within English Heritage, but collaboration across different professions that potentially could use BIM as, as a conduit for sort of enhanced analysis <coughs> and interpretation on a building. Down here, you've got archive, and I'm really pleased that we've got Julian Richards from ADS here, hearing me drone on about BIM, because at the end of the day, we have to think about how these data sets are archived, and we need to have some form of standards generated to help that. Another important milestone for me was when I managed to um, convince the um, people like Barney, for instance, about the need to have BIM uh, embedded within the heritage science strategy. That, to me, has been a very useful hook on which to sort of hang various other work and research. So one of the things that the BIMSIG was doing was looking at the application across the EH estate. 
One of the projects that uh, we are going to be working on is Harmonsworth Barn, which is a 15th century uh, structure located near Heathrow Airport. A very impressive structure. If you haven't been there, I'd strongly recommend that you go and have a look at it when it's open. Uh, it's suffered over the years with neglect. Um, there were various conservation issues um, prior to English Heritage acquiring it in 2012. But it also, it's already had an archive of data that we could tap into. And we're talking about the generation of new data, but I'd emphasize the archive and the need to access the archive, not just for this, but across the board generally. We need to make sure we know where the data sets are. We need to know how we can utilize them. At the time, English Heritage invested in the first laser scanner. That's me pressing the button and then going away for a cup of tea whilst it actually did its stuff. It's quite handy using laser scanning for that. And from that, we generated various data sets that were used <coughs> by various people. You've got engineers, you've got the regional team, and you've got the organisation looking for education and outreach opportunities. We also worked with an organisation called SciArc, which was set up by Ben Kasaira. And you can see how he's focusing on uh, heritage for the future and how we can actually uh, record, preserve it um, for the future as well. But the thing about Harmonsworth Barn is its location. It's just north of Heathrow Airport. And if the third runway goes ahead, Harmonsworth Barn will be no more. It'll actually be underneath the third runway. So maybe um, that's uh, for the future, really. We're, we're, we're still waiting to hear if the government go down that route. But at least we've got this wealth of information. And if we had a sort of a BIM model created, it would help us present the site, but also perhaps relocate the site as well. The other one which I want to highlight is the Iron Bridge. We all, well, I think most of us know about the Iron Bridge, World Heritage Sites, very important and significant structure. This has had various survey uh, data sets captured, um, including laser scanning most recently. Um, but that was brought in because uh, of a need to do a structural assessment of the, um, the bridge. So the laser scan data was used to create very detailed 3D models that could help the engineers do all of their sort of structural um, analyses. The good thing for BIM is that that data is already in a form that could then feed into a BIM model. So creating a BIM for the Iron Bridge, it would help in the visualization side, but it would help the sort of future management, possible conservation, of what is a very well-known World Heritage Site structure. The other area for the BIM SIG was external advice. And BIM is one of those terms that people can cotton on to without fully realising the implication of it. So the regional teams, now in historic England, are faced with um, outside um, organisations, companies, individuals, saying we want to uh, have a bit of BIM, please, on our project. This is a, uh, a refurbishment regeneration project in Lancashire. You can see the, uh, the point cloud data from the, the laser scanning. Um, but the interesting thing with this project is that it started off with one architect who was pro-BIM, and it's now gone on to an architect who is slightly less pro-BIM. So he started to actually... Uh, you know, look at the sort of the data itself and uncover some sort of issues to do with um, the client's expectation but also specification. That leads me on to the work that we do within Historic England on procurement and standards. We're a small team, two and a half, so we can't do the likes of the, the Ray project in Scotland. You know, I'd probably be here until I'm sort of a couple of hundred years old. Um, so we've been using the commercial sector for a long time. But in my experience of 34 years surveying, you need to tell the contractors what you want. You don't want them to actually give you what they think you might want. That's why we've got a standard document that's uh, that thick. Um, so it is quite a hard read, um, but it's there for a reason. 
These are the different sort of groups that we currently procure data from. And you'll see there's a one there which is effectively drones. And <coughs> I'll say drone again because drones are now becoming mainstream so much that that magazine now appears in WH Smith's, even in Tesco's. And there's actually an article about the work that we do in Historic England actually in it. Coincidentally, there's also an, uh, an article about photogrammetry in it. Nothing to do with me, but it's obvious that these technologies are starting to become very, very mainstream. In terms of the document that we have, it's there for a purpose. We want to ensure you get the right survey for the right job at the right time. So this is the document that we pr used to have. Uh, this was the previous version um, that was uh, uh, the second edition um, in 2009. Last year we published the third edition and you can see we've included the widespread use of laser scanning. That's used by a lot of uh, surveyors, archaeological units, typically they hire it in as a way of capturing mass data on an excavation site. Digital cameras, we haven't really talked about digital cameras because people sort of uh, use them all the time. We've got drones and SFM, but we've also included BIM to enable us to specify that and procure it as and when a project comes along. Now, if anyone sort of knows anything about BIM, it is rather complex and it's full of acronyms and it's full of levels as well. But some of the issues there are, you've got level one, which would be a representation, say, of this room, which is simply a, a box. It doesn't have any of the detail. You can go all the way down to the very detailed level, uh, as shown in uh, this representation from Charing Cross uh, Railway Station. Another issue is the uh, importance of fabric information, because BIM starts to make sense when you understand what that wall structure is actually composed of, and what lies behind it as well. Once you feed that into the equation, you can start to do <coughs> accurate analyses rather than generic analyses based on generic components. Also, data formats. BIM, um, there is uh, um, an open format called IFC, which the industry is saying that's the future. IFC is various sort of versions and iterations, rather complex. So I'd like to sort of suggest that the likes of the ADS and the Archive in Historic England and Scotland as well, maybe look at these so that it can put, build them into future guidelines. Now, um, you haven't actually seen any BIM data sets from me. Um, we do have some BIM data sets, but they're mainly for sort of testing purposes. The really exciting thing for me, the fact that BIM is now incorporated within the Heritage Science Strategy, means that people like Barney, on the right here, are talking about BIM within a context like this. This enables us to then sort of facilitate research. At this workshop I attended in um, Manchester yesterday, one of the restrictions or limitations on BIM at the moment is that people haven't actually got any good examples to refer to. Once you present something, something to someone and they can see it and they can see its use, that's when they start to show an interest. It's the same with BIM as well. So here we've got a very, very exciting and powerful research project, a three and a half years collaborative doctoral partnership. That's slightly worrying because things happen quickly in survey, but in terms of BIM, you've got these different deadlines. And fortunately, the next deadline for BIM is 2018. So we've got a project that's starting to span the different governmental mandates uh, that are uh, coming out. <clears throat> so I'm really excited about this project, and the advert for the studentship is now available online. The other exciting project for me is another one linked to the Heritage Science Strategy and it's the use of BIM within a Heritage Science context. Heritage Science within a building, you're talking about um, structural issues, you're talking about fabric decay. With the Iron Bridge, you've got corrosion, for instance, that could be fed into the analytical uh, model. 
So to actually have a project which is once again funded by um, people in Barney's team is very exciting and it's using these data sets that we already have available. We're not having to reinvent the wheel, re-laser scan all of this, these two monuments. We've got this data. But these two monuments don't fit into your normal BIM regular box. They are pushing the boundaries of what BIM can possibly do within Heritage. So in summary, before Barney sort of drags me off, <laughs> BIM is full of acronyms. Uh, the title said HBIM, but it could simply be better information <laughs> management. That could be in a sort of a GIS form, it could be in a purpose developed form, but it's about sort of structural um, uh, consistency across data, sharing it and collaboration. I'll say that again because I know Barney will keep saying it throughout the, uh, the conference. <coughs> the adoption of BIM for heritage is actually low and it's low in other countries as well. Uh, the country that seems to embrace BIM most is Singapore and I've not been to Singapore yet to actually see that for myself. But I first encountered BIM in America in 2009, where all the audience were talking about BIM, and I had to say, please can you tell me what BIM is? The UK is actually is starting to lead the field in certain areas of BIM as well, so it's very exciting what we're doing in terms of heritage. <laughs> Historic England and English heritage are still considering BIM, particularly the application of BIM within projects. It's mainly focused these days on new build, so I'd imagine English Heritage will consider it seriously when there's potentially a sort of a, a new build component to one of their uh, visitor centres, for instance. There is this issue of trying to squeeze irregular heritage structures into the regular box. This is where we need the help of the users and the providers of the software packages that facilitate the process. The likes of Autodesk, the likes of Bentley, we need to lobby them to actually consider heritage seriously and provide us with tools to make it an, a simpler process than it is at the moment. But the I bit in BIM to me is the most important bit, it's the information. And the information within a building, for instance, it's about what the building is made up of. That could be the fabric, but could that also be the archaeological information as well. Mm. But at the end of the day, someone has to pay for it. So without sort of example projects to show and justify the senior managers that sort of control the, the money, um, it may struggle within a heritage context. But I'm hoping that the two projects that Historic England are starting shortly will go a long way to help that justification. On that point, many thanks for listening. And that's the specification document. And you can download a PDF for free from the Historic England website, but if you want a printed copy, it's about £40. So I download the PDF myself. Many thanks. Thank you very much indeed.